Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Dusterberg. I'm a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. We're pleased today to have with us Roya Hakakian on the date uh, of publication of her new book um, on the immigrant experience in America. Um, let me give you a little background on Roya, who is a noted writer in uh, the United States. Uh, she arrived here 36 years ago Having gr grown up in uh, Tehran uh, in a family with a rich cultural heritage, uh, she came to the United States in 1985 um, after becoming disillusioned with the uh, Islamic regime. She uh, attended Brooklyn College. She studied uh, poetry with Allen Ginsberg. She has written two books of poetry in Persian, uh, which I hope we will see some uh, translations of uh, soon. I believe there's a, a volume coming out. Um, her first book in 2004 was a memoir, Journey from the Land of No, which was praised by Harold Bloom as the debut of a writer with, quote unquote, a major literary career. And she's gone on to prove that he was right. Uh, she uh, has worked uh, with 60 Minutes. Uh, she's uh, has written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, New York Review of Books, and appeared on National Public Radio. Uh, she's a fellow at Yale's Davenport College. Um, her second book was a major uh, nonfiction book called The Assassins of the Turquoise Palace, which is a gripping nonfiction account of the Berlin master restaurant assassination of Iran Iranian opposition leaders which is ordered up by the uh, Iranian regime. Um, it's a book that has uh, many insights into how the Islamic regime operates um, and also how the German uh, judicial system operates. Uh, Christopher Hitchens, the, the great uh, political uh, uh, journalist uh, said of this book, even as they continue to breach every known international law all the while protesting at interventions in their internal affairs, the theocrats in Tehran stand convicted of mounting murderous interventions in the affairs of others. Roy Hakakian's beautiful book mercilessly exposes just one of these crimes and stands as a tribute to the courageous dissidents and lawyers in Germany who managed one of the rarest of human achievements, an authentic victory for truth and justice. Um, this Roya's new book, which I'm gonna flash in front of you appearing today, Beginner's Guide to America for the Immigrant and the Curious. This new book, uh, which is published today, combines practical advice to modern immigrants with important observations on the US culture and current affairs, as well as uh, observations on the Islamic regime, which um, Roya left disillusioned 36 years ago. Um, Yale, um, uh, Yale Law School professor Amy Chua noted that this book is, quote, just what America needs at this historical moment. So, Raya, welcome. We look forward to a lively conversation. Why don't you start by telling us a little bit about why you wrote this book? Hi, Tom, and hi, everyone at uh, listening in today. And thank you so much to the Hudson Institute for um, inviting me and uh, organizing this event. I'm very grateful. Um, in 2016, when Donald Trump uh, rose to presidency and when um, the national rhetoric, national conversation about immigrants and immigration started to turn um, or started to adopt a hostile uh, tone, I suddenly felt like I was called into action that, you know, as, as Americans and as a naturalized citizen myself, we all come to certain moments in our lives that we feel like we have been called to service based on who we are, where we come from, what skills we have. And, and I, started listening to what I was hearing about immigrants and, and who they are and what they do to the country. And, and suddenly I felt like I had to say something, that, that this was the moment where I had to pitch in. 
Um, I remember distinctly, um, well, first there was the ban on Muslim nations, which also included my birth country of Iran. And then there was uh, the, you know, the, the rumors and, and uh, the accusations that immigrants come to this country to uh, commit crimes. And, and I thought, um, I don't want to, uh, you know, argue um, and say that no immigrants don't come to this country to commit crimes. I, I thought it was silly to, you know, reach for data and try to analyze um, through, you know, use of statistics to prove that the overwhelming majority of immigrants come to this country to um, build uh, a new life or contribute to another life elsewhere where they come from. I thought my contribution would be to try to bring readers, um, if not inside the immigrant experience, then at least as close to the immigrant experience as possible and leave it for the audience, for readers to decide whether based on what they read, it would be possible for the immigrant to come here and, and begin to contemplate uh, committing the crimes that they were being accused of. I thought my, my contribution, my act of service would be to, to share the truth of what it is uh, to be uprooted and what it's like uh, to try to resettle and, and you know, start a life from scratch again. And maybe if I just do that, then people would think twice about believing the things that they were being told. And, and so that's what I was uh, trying to do. And in the process of trying to kind of explain who the immigrant is and, and what the immigrant experience is like, I found that I was also explaining and revealing certain aspects of America that I am certain I was certain then, and I'm even more certain now, that Americans who are born and raised in this country uh, no longer see or uh, really acknowledge as small miracles of their own lives. Um, for instance, I thought, you know, all these beautiful things in, in America that work incredibly well, um, which in turn improve the routines of life that we take for granted are small miracles of the way this beautiful democracy works. And, and I think um, as I began writing, uh, you know, with my first intention, which was to try to explain the immigrant to, to everyone else, I realized that I'm also trying to explain these aspects of America that so many people who, um, who have never had another experience under another system, another uh, you know, government uh, cannot see or may not be able to recognize. And so I, I realized that I'm um, performing a dual act. Um, on one hand, I, I try to explain the immigrant and, I, and on the other hand, I'm trying to look at America through the perspective of something, uh, someone who has lived under an undemocratic and tyrannical order. And, and so what are those small, beautiful, incredible things that may not appear to the eyes of everyone else? And so in the process, um, you know, I, I start to share some observations, for instance, um, about the way in which say we in America are able to um, return a garment after three weeks of using um, that garment back to the store where we purchased it from. You know, is that, is that just an accident or is that just uh, simply something we have here? Or can we identify all these little things and, and say um, the reason we, we have these easy, convenient, um, enjoyable lives are because of the accumulation of so many small gifts that the American democracy has granted us. And so that basically amounts to this book, which many people have called it a very patriotic book. And in some ways, although I'm in many parts, I am critical and I do see 
um, where we can improve things. But um, I do admit that it is a patriotic book um, while it also tries to um, acknowledge uh, some of the misunderstandings that have been going on about immigrants and the immigrant experience. So that's, uh, that's my opening remarks. And uh, since we spoke earlier and you uh, asked me to pick out a segment to read, um, I have prepared a short passage that I can um, read. It, it's a couple of minutes and maybe that gives a flavor of what the book sounds like. Please go ahead. Sure. Um, so the book is somewhat divided into two sections. Uh, the first four chapters deal with the earlier experiences of an immigrant's arrival. And the final four chapters deal with what happens after resettlement and, and when life uh, begins to feel so-called normal and what are the things that uh, immigrants begin to experience and observe then. And so this passage is from a chapter called the diaspora. And, um, and so here it goes. In lieu of haggling, once the most satisfying aspect of any shopping experience for your fellow expatriates, they have embraced the exercise of returning, which might well be haggling's fair-haired twin. On weekends, they load their spacious trunks with the purchased goods they, they plan to return something that was unthinkable where they came from. At first, they even return the things they need just to see if they can. When this belief gives way to faith in the sanctity of the return policy, they begin to return only what truly needs returning. They had expected to see the suspension bridges, the underwater tunnels, the endless forests and bottomless seas, but it is the exercise of returning goods that is the surest sign of America's greatness to them. The experience of an underwater tunnel lasts only a few minutes. However, the experience of a trial sweatshirt whose price tag scratches against the nape lasts for days. It is why they cherish their receipts and keep them alongside other well-guarded family treasures. Returning items is the proof that the consumer one of the several manifestations of the citizen is formidable here. It is the evidence that anything is possible because a one-time decision need not be destiny. You can change your fate here and turn it in for a better one. Taking the oath of allegiance is a rote promise. To stand head high at a customer service counter, receipt in hand, turning in an unwanted garment is an actual step toward claiming one's rights, acting as an entitled citizen would. Even after all these years, each time a reluctant shopkeeper takes an item back, you stagger out in awe, praising God and his most unsung messenger, George Washington. This is one of the many small joys of living in America that only you, privileged with a keen knowledge of despotism, deeply cherish. That will give you a flavor of the beautiful writing that uh, Roya deploys throughout this book and some of the wry observations that she makes about uh, American culture. We frequently need to have uh, outside perspective, I think, to better understand uh, American culture, American politics even. Um, Roya, uh, this book was called, I believe by the Wall Street Journal reviewer, a love story uh, of American democracy or something to that effect. Um, but she doesn't sugarcoat, uh, as she mentioned in her opening remarks, uh, the history of immigration in America, which is frequently not um, a pretty picture. Nonetheless, she has, um, sage advice, I think, to immigrants. In fact, she closes her book um, after having said that uh, perhaps um, immigrants understand the American founding documents even better than Americans. But she closes her, books, her book with this remark. And this is uh, advice after receiving the certificate of citizenship. Do not mistake the certificate for a deed. You can only guard her grandeur, not claim it. 
citizenship does not give you the ownership of this land. It only gives you the honor of her stewardship, the pride of upholding her principles and of keeping her fire burning to warm all the generations to come. So can immigrants um, help to uh, calm the, the fires of modern politics in America in any way? And what, would, what specific advice would you give them? Um, you know, I think this is probably one of the things that, uh, that one of the most important lessons I took away from January 6th, 2021. Um, I think that, you know, prior to this, I thought we as immigrants come here to rebuild our lives. We as immigrants come here to, um, you know, f work the farms and be doctors in hospitals and take care of the elderly and, you know, all the things that we all uh, uh, have always seen and assumed about immigrants. But on January 6th, um, as I watched people uh, climb the walls of the Capitol and, and suddenly I, I had a flashback to uh, my own childhood in Tehran when I was watching the students of the Imam line uh, climb the, the walls of the US embassy in Tehran and, and the two images began to overlap. Then I saw that um, it, you know, these Americans are making similar mistakes, which can only, in my view, be attributed to the fact that they don't realize what an, an incredible gift this, this structure ha is offering, not only to Americans, but also to the rest of the world. And, and you know, especially to activists around the world who, who are hoping, who are in prison dreaming of building a similar structure in their own countries. And I thought that Here's what we ought to do. We ought to pass on the small lessons of what this democracy is giving us. Because we often think of democracy as, you know, as a four year affair. You know, we go, you know, we elect somebody and we have electoral rights or we have freedom of speech and that's democracy. Well, yeah, that, that is democracy if you're looking at it through a very narrow political perspective. But democracy also gives us many small privileges that, that make this life what it is. Democracy makes it possible for all of us as say, you know, drivers of motor vehicles to behave sanely when we are on roads. Because if you have been to the Middle East, especially in Iran, uh, to Iran, where you know I I used to lose my mind whenever we you know my father sat behind the wheel of a car and we you know decided to take off. It the experience of driving can be terrifying, because because even driving in a place where um, there is no democracy becomes an act of a protest. And so if you don't believe in the laws of a country, you do not abide by any laws, including traffic laws, right? And so when you, you set off to do something as simple as drive to, you know, uh, five minutes away to, to the grocery store, you find yourself in the middle of a small hell, which um, driving in many parts of the Middle East can be. So I think it's important and perhaps this is precisely what someone like me can tell fellow Americans, what we as immigrants can offer, is that the reason this life works the way it does, the reason we um, drive comfortably on our um, streets and avenues and avoid you know, gridlocks or you know, uh, avoid major traffic accidents is, is in part, in, in big part, because we all have faith that though our laws are not perfect, and though our justice system can certainly use improvement, that this, these laws are good and they improve our life. And, and that small manifestation is one sign of democracy. And all of these small things uh, need to be recognized and then guarded. And part of the reason why I think we are so, as Americans, um, ready 
to reconsider and give them up and, and rebel is that we are failing to recognize these small signs in everyday life, that we have reduced democracy to just that one big thing that takes us to the polls every four years. It is that, but it's not only that. And unless we see it's small signs throughout our lives on a daily basis, we fail to safeguard um, the democracy that, that we ought to cherish. Roy, another passage that struck me um, that draws a contrast between what you experienced in Iran, the early revolutionary days especially, but perhaps longer than that, and what happens in the United States comes from a passage of your comments on learning the English language. You say, English, on the other hand, will liberate you for it comes with the bold American attitude in tow. A simple switch from your language to English will have miraculous effects. You will be unchained. You will say exactly what you mean, what you want, and what you mean. Can you explain that a little bit to our listeners? I'd be happy to. So, um, the, you know, I, I used to watch my nieces and nephews as they interacted with my parents, uh, their grandparents. And I used to see that, you know, they would come in front of my parents and be entirely different little kids. They would be, yes, grandma, no grandma, you know, and, and they would cast their eyes down and they would be uh, super quiet and, and super polite. And then they would take off and go to the next room and speak to their parents or even me and be, you know, rambunctious, uh, just entirely different creatures as if, you know, the person who was, uh, you know, in the living room is not exactly the person who's in, you know, in another room. And so I started thinking that that little switch in, in the language, going from speaking Persian to my parents to speaking English to me, it liberated them, set them free. And I started thinking, why? Well, for one thing, um, Persian, just like German, and you know, uh, has uh, you know a way of incorporating deference into uh, its pronouns. So you know, you have a, a second person address as a regular you, but then you also have a deferential second person singular address um, that that just elevates that you to something higher and, and more respectable. And so in German, it's, um, you know, the difference is, bet is between the du and the z, both of which refer to second person singular, but one is informal and one is formal. Well, we have that in Persian too, except that, you know, once, once you start using the formal expression, the formal pronoun, then everything else, including the verb and the way um, you know, the rest of the syntax works also changes to adjust itself. And therefore it, it immediately straps you down into place and makes you, uh, via the language, behave differently. Um, in addition, I, I remember uh, going to college and, you know, writing the way I used to write in Persian. And, and one of the things that um, one of my first professors ever wrote um, on, on a paper I turned in was, um, it, it's written beautifully, but I don't get it. <laughs> and, and it really, um, it was very interesting. I mean, my professor probably could have gone on for a page or two to, to elaborate on what he meant, but I instantly knew what he was trying to say. He was trying to say, don't do what you do in Persian, which is, um, it's not enough to sound beautiful. Um, I don't need your ambiguous expressions. I need you to state what it is you think very clearly in the shortest number of words possible. And that is precisely the opposite of what we do in Persian, that you're not supposed to put what it is that you want uh, directly. Uh, it's, it's, you know, aesthetically, it's not considered uh, beautiful. But also, you know, in a country like Iran, where censorship is rampant, um, you wouldn't want to state what it is that you think 
very obviously, very clearly, you want uh, to leave some room in case the big brother starts knocking on your door, um, you can leave yourself some wiggle room and say, oh no, you know, you were wrong to think um, that I meant to say this, I really meant to say that. So, um, so I think it's amazing how English or uh, the way we Americans, Americans now use English is uh, a manifestation of the freedom and the egalitarian culture that we have cultivated. And that, you know, a simple switch to another language uh, can strip um, us of all of those, again, I'm going to repeat the word gifts that, that this, um, you know, this order has given us. And, and I know that by virtue of being bilingual and feeling it every day as I switch back and forth between the two. Well, that's an interesting observation, and I'd like to take that to a higher cultural level, if you will. Sure. Uh, you're a published poet in Persian. You come from a long tradition of poets in, in your family. Yes. Um, yet you make this rather remarkable statement um, about American poetry. You, um, you say, whereas your nation has a more ancient poetic tradition, American poetry surpasses in themes and fullness of expression all the poetry in your literature. The boons of, of democracy are never ending where the unfettered artist with his brawny self can speak, write, paint, and do what his imagination may conjure. My French friends might disagree with that characterization, but you clearly believe that. What is it about American poetry that you find so liberating? Well, um, you know, again, um, I, I look for all these virtues, um, you know, I, I find the roots of them in the American democracy. Um, you know, I, I, I wrote an essay about this, which aired on NPR um, a few years ago, where I said, here I was, you know, a, a newly arrived immigrant, and I was, um, you know, low on confidence. Uh, I thought so many things that I had brought with myself to this country were totally useless because, um, you know, because there were just so many things that were better here uh, than the things I had brought. But then I thought, you know, whatever they have that may be superior to what it is that I have, they can't top me or top the tradition I come from in poetry. And then <laughs> one day, um, I think it was, I don't remember exactly whether it was Allen Ginsberg or uh, just haphazardly I fell upon it, but I fell upon a poem by Theodore Rutke called My Puppet's Waltz. It's one of the greatest poems by Theodore Rutke. And it's the story of um, a father who's, it's not a story, but it's a, it's a um, short poem about a father who's uh, physically abusing his son. And um, the uh, the poem is being told through the perspective of the son who's being beaten by the father. And I read this and I thought it was the most staggering thing I have ever read as a poem. And the reason was I reached back into my memory and I remembered that there was nothing like this in, in all the thousand years of Persian poetry in which a boy thought that he could A, talk about his own suffering at the hands of B, the father of the family, uh, who is almost never questioned in Persian poetry because you know, the patriarch will always remain the patriarch. And I thought, my God, you know, we have had how, you know, this, this 2000 year tradition of poetry. And yet there are themes that we have not allowed to enter this tradition because there are ways in which we have not allowed the hierarchy of our, of our society to ever be broken. And so my Papa's Waltz was a, was a perfect example. So I think the reason our, you know, American poets reach for anything, anything, is because they are free to do so. 
um, is because you know the the social hierarchy is such that the self is above and beyond everything else and everyone else, as opposed to you know the the leader or the father or you know the patriarch in the family, and and therefore that opens up the space for the imagination to to do at the uh, to do as the imagination wishes, and I think the variety uh, uh, of the themes that are expressed in poetry and literature um, make for a perfect example of that. Right, one more um, uh, observation that you make about the United States uh, from fresh eyes struck me as fairly interesting and important. Um, you note that uh, Americans um, often have cemeteries in the middle of their towns and that they're not afraid to uh, enter those cemeteries. Um, you write, Americans do not fear their deceased nor try to hide or avoid them. Several, several of their earliest cemeteries were in fact meant to be used as parks by visitors. Um, and you say, the nation has no trouble passing by their dead as they go about the business of life. The departed remain among them, the resting places, a natural part of cityscapes. It reminded me of the famous uh, quote by William Faulkner that the rest, the past is never dead. In fact, it's not even past. What were you trying to say by making this observation about America? Well, um, I was trying to say that um, we should all remember um, how wedded we are to the project of life and living. And, and that it isn't the way things are in, in so many other countries, um, and certainly not in Iran where I come from. Um, you know, first of all, I, I had never seen a cemetery in my life until I left Iran, because the cemeteries were these dark, far away places that were outside of the city limits. And if you wanted to go to the cemetery, you actually had to, you know, plan and, you know, make a day of it because it was far away. And then it was, uh, it would turn into a, a big, you know, a production, so to speak. Um, <laughs> I remember um, my mother and I were lost. In fact, we were in Geneva one day and I thought, well, you know, we're lost in Geneva. We might as well, um, you know, turn it into something positive. So um, I, I didn't, I, we got off the, the, uh, the bus we were on and uh, I saw beautiful trees and, you know, flowers and it was a very green space. And I said, oh, look, there's a beautiful park. Um, let's go, you know, we picnic there and we had sandwiches with us and we went inside and and as we were trying to get comfortable and sit on benches um, my mother spotted a couple of you know headstones and she pointed to me and you know I looked at them and we suddenly recognized we were in a cemetery and we were gasping you know because uh, a cemetery isn't supposed to be a place that you just haphazardly walk into and you know decide to eat your sandwiches in there. A cemetery is a place to be somber in and you know, you, it's not supposed to be around. You're supposed to go there with a different uh, perspective to you know, grieve and all that. And suddenly, you know, we were in the middle of the city, we got off the bus, we had sandwiches in our bags and you know, it was a beautiful space and there we were you know, um, it, on top of a couple of graves. And, and I realized that later when I came to the US, it was the same way that, that life always goes on. That, you know, the cemeteries don't stop you because the dead don't stop you in, in America because we always know that even as tragedy happens, our job is to go on. And, and I think you know, the, the, the moment in, in my years in America that completely drove that notion home for me was 9-11. I was in New York City. The, the towers came down. It, it would have shut down any city in any other country, certainly in places where I have been. And 
it didn't shut down New York. I mean, it shut New York down for a day or two, but within a week, life had resumed. And that's, that's an incredible quality that, that America has that, you know, it's not only a question of resilience, you know, a lot of other uh, nations are resilient too, but there is an attachment to the idea of life. And there is a commitment to living and living fully that I think, um, you know, is, is fundamentally American. And the fact that, you know, we have our cemeteries here within city limits, we pass by them as we go to the grocery store, or we go to the pharmacy, and we understand that, you know, it's, you know, people pass, but life goes on and, um, and the dead don't stop us. And I think that's um, another small uh, miracle of, of why our lives are, are pleasant and go on as smoothly as they do here most of the times. Okay, let's uh, switch gears just a little bit. Um, you have, uh, throughout your career, um, um, not shied away from uh, commenting on politics, um, both in the Iranian context um, and in the American context. Um, you've um, called it like you see it. You put yourself perhaps at danger by uh, doing things like exposing the uh, murderous act in Berlin, which was the subject of your second book. Um, but your sensibility as a cultural commentator is also uh, feeds into that in certain ways. Um, you've noted that the importance of narrative or what we now call narrative, how people in one country talk about another country as being important to both the self-image and perhaps the propaganda efforts of other countries. Could you uh, tell us a little bit about your thinking uh, about how America, American politicians talk about Iran, uh, shapes politics in Iran, and vice versa, how the Ira Iranian narrative, which we can still see on Twitter, for instance, how that uh, is intended to shape American politics. Sure. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, not, it's not something I, you know, sat one day to, you know, study the, the Iranian narrative and how um, the American, uh, it feeds the American narrative, political narrative and, and all that. It, it was something that, uh, I, I was observing um, as early as, you know, 1979, when I was a little girl, I realized that, it, you know, the, the story, the, the grand story of Iran suddenly shifted in 1979, right? So, you know, here I was a girl in, in school and the opening pages of every textbook I had in school um, were the images of uh, the Shah, the king, his wife and their son. And all of a sudden, you know, there, we went to school one day and, and we were told to rip those pages out. And here I was thinking, oh my God, you know, for all these years, I've been, I've been opening these pages as if they're sacred pages. Um, I would stare into the queen's smile and, and feel good, you know, because I believed in them. And then, you know, all of a sudden you go to school one day and they say, rip them up. And, and so I, I had to begin to think who decides who's good and who's bad and who decides all of a sudden that all these people whom we thought were you know, the fathers of the nation and the people to whom the nation owed everything it had were suddenly evil. And so it, it was a sensitivity that I developed because um, I, I had seen um, you know, two, two opposing systems trying to um, sell two opposing narratives within the span of, you know, a few months to a year. And so I think what makes the case of Iran really interesting is, um, especially vis-a-vis -vis America, is that 
in, in the first 10 years of the Iranian revolution, right after 1979, um, the, uh, you know, the, the idea of hostility with America was a, a major cornerstone of the regime's existence, that the regime defined itself around this hostility. And then, you know, um, it, it also paid off because, um, you know, it, the, the religious order in Iran, the religious leadership um, needed to unify the nation. And so not, not all of the nation, especially not the middle-class cosmopolitan Iranians um, were as religious as, you know, the people who had taken the power in Iran. And therefore they needed to bring them along too. So anti-Americanism became a very important tool to unify the nation because a lot of the uh, you know, middle-class, uh, you know, urbanized, uh, idealistic youth who were in universities, they were not religious, but you know, they assumed themselves socialists or idealists. They too uh, objected to U.S. imperialism. So uh, the anti-Americanism that the Iranian regime used was a perfect tool by which to, to unify the nation, to bring along you know, the non-religious around the, the singular idea, the fundamental idea that even though you're not religious, we all need to create a unified front against America. And that worked um, for a very long time. I think what has changed now is that the regime is still trying to use that old narrative, but the people after 43 years no longer buy the demonization of America because Iran has not had relations with the US for more than 40 years. And the sanctions have not always been in place, but the miseries that the nation has been suffering have never changed. So they can't attribute what's going on in Iran, you know, the absence of freedoms of speech, the, you know, the fact, the simple fact that women are not allowed to go to um, soccer stadiums and watch a match uh, has nothing to do with America. So I think what has happened is that over the years, over the decades of the absence of relations between the US and Iran, the, the people have come to a place where the regime no longer um, recognizes. The regime continues to want to sell anti-Americanism as, as the tool by which they originally um, sold the revolution to everyone, but the people aren't buying it anymore, which is why at so many demonstrations in the past year or two in Iran, you hear people say, our enemy is not outside, our enemy is right here in this country, which I think is, you know, <laughs> is the most revolutionary, the most groundbreaking idea that has come out of Iran in recent years by way of, you know, political uh, expression. Um, and, and I, it, it, and the last point I want to make is that I think that the sad piece of this the whole thing is that Iranians, the nation has come to a place where they do not see America as the evil that the regime told them it was 43 years ago. But Americans are still back there buying what the regime sold to the Iranian people 43 years ago to this day still. And, and I think in some ways the American you know, policymaker circles or people who are trying to think about Iran have also uh, bought this, uh, you know, uh, anti-Americanism of the Iranian regime as a valid complaint or as a valid uh, narrative and, and kind of keep looking into themselves as um, having caused uh, justly that national complaint on behalf of Iran. And whereas, you know, the Iranian nation has moved on from this, um, I feel that the two governments 
have not. And so there is a major discrepancy between the narrative that Iranians have developed over the past several years and the old narrative that seems to um, survive uh, the facts on the ground. If you were to give advice to American uh, political uh, and thought leaders who um, comment on the situation in, in Iran, is there a way that you would suggest that they talk about the dynamic between the two countries that would speak more directly to the Iranian people and to your what you characterize as a changing perception on the ground among uh, wide swaths of the people in Iran to promote that better understanding and promote um, possibly political change in Iran? Well, it's, it, it's a speech I give in my sleep, Tom. <laughs> you know, it's, it's something that I, uh, you know, dream someone important will ask me so I will have the opportunity to, to say uh, what I really uh, believe, which is that, um, you know, uh, let's, let's be done with this silly reformist hardliner, uh, you know, division making, you know, we, it, because it's become sort of as silly as the good cop, bad cop uh, policy that parents use with respect to their children, you know, to, to punish them. And I, and I think it's as, uh, again, it's as silly and as useless as that. Um, you know, the reform movement, uh, began in 1997 with the rise of President Khatami to power. And it's now 24 years later. And, and the reform movement has failed to do even the simplest, most basic changes that any reform movement could have accomplished elsewhere, right? Like something as simple as allowing women to attend soccer stadiums. I mean, what can, be, what can be more basic than that? Saudi Arabia is allowing that. Afghan women who were on their burqas, you know, a few years ago are, are allowed in their stadiums. Iranian women aren't. And, and that's, that speaks to the silliness of the notion that there is reform and these people 24 years on are still trying to change anything or can possibly be effective. So I think it's time to be done. You know, if there was reform, it's failed. And if there were people who really truly thought they could do something, well, they had 24 years to do it and they haven't gotten it done. So let's be done with that. And the second thing I think is really important is that Iranians have agency. And to think that if I was at a panel discussion uh, a couple of weeks ago and someone said, if the US lifts sanctions on Iran, then the regime will um, lift limitations on women and women will have more rights and women will be freer in Iran. Well, first of all, the US sanctions didn't exist you know, 20 years ago, at least not the ones that, that have been pressing the regime over the past several years to this extent. And the regime was still the same regime and, and women were still under the same pressures. And, and to assume that everything that the US does, it, you know, um, it, it causes the people of Iran to sway one way or another is to strip the people of Iran of agency. Last year after uh, the, you know, Qasem Soleimani was uh, killed in a drone strike by, by U.S. forces. The first thing that everybody started to say was that now the people of Iran are going to band together against America. Well, it, you know, I, I, no nation likes to see that another power uh, do deliver justice uh, to, to in any way, shape or form without uh, proper prosecution, without trial and all that. So I'm sure the people of Iran, even, even those who did or didn't have, whoever they were, you know, the, the ones who supported Soleimani and the ones who didn't, would have preferred Soleimani stand trial and, and be tried for whatever crimes he was being punished for. 
However, at the same time, to think that Iranians have not had a 43 year experience with the regime and to think that one simple act could make them go this way or that is, is to strip the people of a sense of dignity and agency and is to say that, you know, they're merely you know, a, a, a bunch that can, um, you know, simply be uh, herded from one side to the other. It isn't so. And, and it often comes from the fact that we cover uh, Iran in ways that uh, our media chooses to. For instance, you know, six weeks before Soleimani was attacked, um, 1,500 uh, protesters in Iran in, in some of the largest protest movements ever since 1979 had been killed on the streets. 7,000 people had been rounded up and arrested. So this is the very nation that six weeks before the, the attack on Soleimani had seen these protests be quashed very violently and, and hardly anyone covered it. And so it, if we choose to cover one story and, and give that prominence, we can't at the same time think that because we have chosen to recognize this as the big news, that it is the big news for Iran as well. And, and because there is so much else that we're not covering. And, and I think that's um, the second point that I wanna leave here, which is that um, the, the coverage uh, doesn't tell the full story of what's happening in Iran. Well, in speaking of agency of the, of the people in Iran, um, I, I'm not a, expert on Iranian history, but the imposition of Islamic ideology in a very radical form is not part of and parcel of the Iranian tradition, as far as I know. Um, has the, um, it does the culture of the past, I mean, both high culture and popular culture of the past continue to be viable in Iran and is is that one factor that may lead to eventually to political change in Iran? Um, it, it's it's very interesting because you know one of the things that um, where you know the Persian New Year is right around the corner on March twentieth. It's the you know it celebrates the arrival of spring. Um, it was one of the things that the regime, especially Ayatollah Khomeini, the, the founder of the Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, tried to uh, eliminate uh, from the calendar. And it was the one thing that uh, people didn't let go of. And, and the more they tried to um, you know, say, uh, we are first and foremost an Islamic nation uh, and we, are, uh, we feel our solidarity with all the other Islamic nations, uh, people continued to and, and even emphasized uh, the Persian traditions that preceded uh, even the advent of Islam, including the Persian New Year. So I think, um, I think it's, it's very, uh, the, the Persian identity has been um, incredibly significant in, in um, allowing the people to um, uh, define a sense of resilience for themselves uh, and, and believe that there is something other than what is being imposed on them that defines them as a people. And, and I hope that as you put it, this can light the way to a different future for Iran. And again, are there ways that um, outsiders, Americans, um, political, cultural leaders can help to uh, promote that sort of um, uh, persistence of, of, of traditional culture and self-identity that uh, has been erased by the Islamic uh, radicals? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, it, it, Iran has always been ethnically, religiously, uh, culturally a very diverse place, um, including the fact that you know, women, for instance, um, were able to put on the hijab or the Islamic uh, uh, dress or not. 
Um, and there are widespread movement throughout Iran, um, you know, small acts of civil disobedience um, uh, all the time that, that uh, women stage in order to um, protest the, this mandatory uh, dress code on them. Um, let's support these women. You know, let's, let's make sure in whatever conversation that we have, uh, government to government or negotiations, that we make sure that these women who so bravely are going out onto the streets and taking their mandatory dress code off um, are acknowledged as, as uh, authentic um, Iranian women who wish to do simply what people three generations before them, two generations before, before them were able to do. Um, we, we have had this uh, diversity of uh, you know, expression, even in, in the way women dress. And, and let's acknowledge that as uh, we move forward in, in uh, whatever it is that we try to uh, uh, rebuild with Iran again. Okay, on, on those words, uh, Roya, we, we're just about out of time. I wanna thank you for um, uh, sharing your, your very uh, uh, rich insights into both American culture and politics and Iranian culture and politics. And again, I commend uh, all of our listeners to, to pick up your new book. It, it contains rich insights, uh, even richer than we've been able to uh, talk about today. So thank you again for being with us. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. And thank you Hudson again for organizing. And I enjoyed chatting with you, Tom, very much.